the 5th to 12th century AD. Um, we are going to focus now on a site with in Pickland, um, a site that's more famous really for its carved stone uh, monuments, Aberlimno. So Aberlimno is placed right at the southern edge of Pickland, just to the east of Meagol. And unlike this cluster of sites that have some historical references, um, like we said, Aberlimno is better known for its corpus of early medieval sculpture, um, an incredible array of first to third century, A, or first to class one to class three symbol stones. Um, we have all set in within the townland boundary of Aberlimno itself. We have things like the lovely butt naked warrior carving at Westerton at the southern tip, which is similar to um, the recently found um, Tullock Walker or the Kalesi warrior carving. We have a really ornately inscribed um, class three symbol stone at the northeastern part of the townland. And then really within the core of Aberlimno itself, we have the famous group of symbol stones at the roadside, as well as a series of other symbol stones that have been ploughed up over the course of a number of years. The most famous of these symbol stones is obviously the battle, the battle scene where we have the depiction of the native Picts repelling the invading Northumberlands or Northumbrians. And these Northumbrians are identified by their characteristic helmets. My favorite part of the scene is a dead Northumbr Northumbrian soldier with eyes presumably being pecked out by a crow. Although if you look closely at the carving, it looks more like a bald chicken, but this scene is very important because it describes a battle with the invading Northumbrians and it's suggested that this is describing the famous battle of Nectensmere. And this is where a Northumbrian king comes up and is repelled by a native uh, Pictish king. It's thought to either be um, Donectin, which is a townland very close to Aberlimno, just to the southeast, or further field in Speyside at Dunacton. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I don't really care if this is the famous area of the Battle of Nectensmere, because if we look at the archeology span of the area, there is something really special going on here. And unfortunately, um, this really is where the history and archeology span of uh, Aberlimno um, ends because there's been very little, if any, excavation or survey done in the area prior to the University of Aberdeen starting our work here in 2017. So if we look at the archeological landscape, we have uh, five key areas. We have uh, at the Southern part here, this um, wire carved stone um, close to a number of enclosures and burial monuments. We have the incredible um, collection of five hill forts on Turin Hill. We have the concentration of Pictish symbol stones at Aberlimino itself. We have the Balbany enclosure, Cropmark enclosure, which is close to loads of other um, possible level burial monuments, as well as a collection of known uh, kist monuments found in the earlier part of the 20th century, 19th and 20th century. So um, we came to this landscape uh, brought to it by the symbol stones and the um, battle carving. And we really want to test if any of the archaeological features we see on the map here date to the early medieval period. And if they can, could they really extend or add to the narrative of the battle? So the obvious first choice was the concentration of forts on Turin Hill. Here we have a very large hill fort, which on the looks of things, probably dates to the early Iron Age. Um, on top of that, we have an oblong fort, which should date to 400, 200 BC. And then set on top of that, and on either side of it, we have these much smaller ring forts, which if we look at Comparand in the Western Isles, potentially these could date to the early medieval period. So these were key to date. And obviously all of our hard work turned to Nothing, because yes, our big fort was early Iron Age, 
Yes, our Ablong Fort is 400, 200 BC, but those three small ring forts actually date to the Middle and Late Iron Age. And even another small ring fort a few kilometers along the ridge to Torn Hill at Rob's Reed Fort, that too is similar. It dated to the Middle and Late Iron Age. So um, we buried our heads in the sand for a year and came back with renewed vigor. And we did a small trench at a place called Balbini. And this crop mark enclosure, you can see here, it has four possible entrances. And then on the eastern side of it, we have a series of curving crop marks, which probably suggest um, Iron Age activity in the form of suterines. And we dug a few slot trenches across the enclosing elements near the entrance. We found this really uh, strange fill where we had a um, initial silting with some really degraded animal bone. We have this uh, homogeneous backfill material. And then on top of that, we had a really um, charcoal rich layer, which had a lot of animal teeth, which suggests a lot of uh, acidic soils uh, degrading the animal bone here. Uh, unfortunately here, um, all of our, our few dates that initially came back um, showed that the enclosure was built, um, backfilled, and abandoned in the 5th, 6th century AD. And that's really important because the enclosure at Balbini um, is of a very similar size and shape to the famous enclosure at Bar Flat and Rhiney, which again dates to the 5th, 6th century AD in date. And there are very few of these monuments that date to that time period. Uh, and comparisons at Rhiney suggest that this might be associated with some sort of a royal landscape, an important royal landscape. So um, we did a bit more excavation a year later with our undergrad archaeology students, where we excavated a, a, a much larger area of the enclosing elements, as well as a big area within the interior to try and characterize the internal deposits. Um, we found, again, very similar deposits uh, within the enclosing elements of the enclosure itself. All of it, again, dating to the 5th, 6th century AD. So uh, really reinforcing the idea that this is an early medieval monument. Within the interior, then, we found this very, very large wooden post structure and something that looked like a, a more traditional roundhouse, as well as the edge of souterrain. All of that came back um, middle to late Iron Age, some of it 3rd to 4th century AD. So not this early medieval time period that we're looking for, um, but very we have no obvious activity associated with that sixth century creation of the enclosure itself. But if we look directly um, uh, within the landscape of the Balbini enclosure, this Balbini is placed up on top of the edge of this ridge here, and then in the lower land um, to the southeast of it, we have a series of um, recorded kist burials, as well as some uh, an extant cairn and some possible uh, ring barrows. And you can see here, this is looking uh, along an aerial shot, looking along from Balbini, you can see the extant cairn. And then over the course of the last few years, we've been doing some flying uh, with the drone, identifying some crop mark enclosures, probably large uh, ring barrows and burial monuments. And the interesting thing about this landscape is directly overlooked by Balbini, um, this area here, the mains of Melgund, has been recorded by antiquarians in the mid 19th century as an area that could be a very, very large kist cemetery. So Stuart wrote that the farmers at Melgund admits that in leveling down a many, uh, great many hillocks on his farm, uh, he buried the bones in the. Uh, he buried the bones where he found it convenient and used the coffin slabs for covers on his drains. And then Jervis um, recorded that kists were so numerous um, till the last few years that on opening the smallest hillock, specimens could be procured at convenience and almost all of them contained um, human remains. So that's suggesting this area here, directly overlooked by Balbeni, is probably a very, very large uh, ancient burial ground. And our geophysical surveys 
in this area have identified uh, quite a large number of circular and square barrows, which suggest that there are early medieval um, burials within the area. But if we look closely at the LIDAR, we can see this group, this linear group of what are probably level cairns. And four of the five kists recorded in the uh, late 19th and 20th century um, show that uh, four of them are bang on top of the center of these possible uh, cairns. So unfortunately, um, or fortunately for some, the material culture from these kists suggests that they're Neolithic or Bronze Age. So what's probably happening here is that we have this ancient burial ground that's being reused in the early medieval period and that's something that continues on in the archaeology um, in other areas within the Aberliminal landscape. So now we have uh, a nice enclosure with nothing going on within the interior. We have a possible large ancient burial ground with early medieval reuse. We're really missing our ecclesiastical uh, monument and our habitation site. So what we did next was we targeted the church site, which is really at the core of this collection of early medieval sculpture. And we did some extensive geophysical surveys in the area. And the church here is, is just beyond the edge of the survey. We had no sign of any early monastic vallum or any early architecture that might be associated with an early church. What we did find was a concentration of enclosures and features just to the east here on this tiny little rise in the field that might suggest some sort of elite settlement. The geophysical survey showed two positive uh, linear features um, surrounding a negative feature which uh, was interpreted as a double palisade enclosure retaining a stone bank. Within that we had a very large square post-built post -built structure containing this area of strong magnetic enhancement, which could be a floor layer. Um, we have a variety of other enclosures, other possible floor layers. And then this area up here, which is this, that was interpreted as a possible kiln or metalworking area. And then we have a possible square barrow here as well. So over the course of about a year, we excavated a number of trenches um, across these key features to try and characterize them and date them. Uh, and, and actually since February 22, we've done a few other small bits and pieces in the area here. So the first thing we did was we tried to date this, um, this double palisaded enclosure. Uh, we characterized it, identified, yes, it is a double palisaded enclosure and it did probably retain a core of stone. Then we excavated this uh, possible metalworking area. We found heaps and heaps of iron slag. We excavated just outside the double palisade enclosure here to see if this weird mess of magnetic anomalies was um, a possible uh, floor layer for a house. Yes, we identified it as a floor layer. And then we excavated a small one by three trench over the edge of this square anomaly here. And <clears throat> This was on day one, it was on the evening of day one. Myself and our former PhD student, Dr. Zach Hinckley, um, were very tired in the evening. Zach wasn't gonna be there the next day. There was a load of cows and one really uh, vigorous bull in the field. So I asked Zach, do you mind staying on for an extra hour? We'll dig this one by three really quickly and I won't have to come back tomorrow and die alone. And within 20 minutes of opening the site, we started to come across uh, this uh, incredible symbol stone. Um, one of the most fortuitous one by three um, trench you'll ever see. The first thing we uncovered was the handle of the mirror. Then we identified the comb and it kept getting better and better. We have the um, mirrors or the disc. Uh, we had a Z rod. We had um, up to seven features, up to, up to seven symbols. Uh, possibly three phases of inscription. And what was amazing about that was it was set within the floor of this very large um, building. The floor itself was comprised of very large stone slabs and probably at the entrance and leading into the center, we have a series of very large stones 
and the symbol stone was placed within this. But as well as the symbol stone, we have a variety of other ancient carvings. We have up to, I think, five Bronze Age cup mark stones, as well as a, a Bronze Age spiral as well there. That's a little, more, a little more faint and difficult to see. So this was, like I said, uh, the threshold and entranceway to the building. Um, you can see the edge of the building here. Uh, and this was one of a number of structures within this complex of sites. We had the edge of a second one here, and then we had that third one in the small um, trench we did outside the double palisaded enclosure. And the key thing about the stone floor was it preserved the archaeology beneath it very well because a lot of the archaeology in the surrounding area has been truncated by agricultural activity. Um, every time the farmer came across this area, he broke his plow, so he stopped plowing it. And that preserved all of our archaeology underneath. We have um, a series of post holes, hearths. We even have this uh, lovely hearth that produced an almost complete uh, bit of iron base, iron furnace base. And then the very lowest phases of activity, we have a series of um, pairs of posts and then a very, very large uh, post hole possibly the entrance post of this early phase, which corresponds with what we think is the rough area of the entrance to the latest phase of activity on the site. So this all was amazing because all of our radiocarbon dates suggested that the earliest phases of activity here dated to around the 7th century AD, that big post hole and those pairs of posts. So that wooden structure dates to probably the 7th century AD. Um, then we had the stone floor layer here, which dates to the 11th, 12th century AD. And we had a series of deposits in between those phases that suggest there's a continuous period of activity on the site and that this was a really, really important, probably royal or a royal uh, household. And then we had activity in places like that uh, metalworking pit, the iron, iron slag there probably um, dates to around the 10th, 11th century AD. So, Abrolimno, we've moved on from this area where there's an incredible collection of symbol stones, and now we know there's something very special happening in the Abrolimno landscape. We have uh, almost continuous period of activity all the way from the 3rd century to the 12th century. So it's really unique in Scottish archaeology. We have a densely occupied landscape with multiple nodes of power. We have places like Turin Hill, where we have that early Iron Age hill fort, middle Iron Age hill fort, late Iron Age ring forts. We have the settlement at Balbini, which dates to the 3rd, 4th century, those Iron Age roundhouses and the Sudorain. Then we have the 5th, 6th century AD enclosure on top of Balbini. And then we have this amazing, what we like to call the Pictish Palace um, at the center of Abrolimno itself, which dates to the 7th, all the way to the 12th century AD. And it's probably in this later period, around the 10th, 11th, 12th century, where it's probably becoming a, 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 a lordship, um, important lordship structure used as a kind of a, a royal caput or a royal um, building. So really settlement appears to have continued all the way into the 10th century and later, and that's the unique thing about Aberlimno itself. So um, thank you very much for listening.